Diane hematemesis. Vomiting blood. Ooh, ugh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do a little <laughs> overview of all the places you can bleed uh, from. Yeah. And I, th I think tip number one is when someone comes in saying they're vomiting blood, make sure they're actually vomiting blood, that it's not coming from somewhere else like hemoptysis, mm -hmm. or that they're bleeding from their nose and that they're actually throwing that up. Mm -hmm. so, or know, it's something that they ate that's red and that's not actually blood at all. Yes, exactly right. So if you go from top to bottom, you can remember all of the different ways that people can bleed along the GI tract, including, of course, esophageal varices and Mallory Weiss tears all right down to ulcers. And then you get into all the intestinal things from ischemic bowel and into susception to angiodysplasia and the diverticula. There's all kinds of things. And then we get down to the bottom of the tract and we see the common things like hemorrhoids and anal you know, fissures and those kinds of bleeding. So there's a lot of things that can bleed along the this way. This is a pretty good diagram. Yeah. It includes Meckles in there. They have a lot of stuff in there. They do. And mm -hmm. the cancers, of course, that we worry about. So there's a lot of different things. And we're going to talk about upper and lower GI bleeding. <clears throat> Now, in terms of the words that we use to describe GI bleeding, we've got hematemesis, which by nature means upper GI bleeding or proximal to the ligament of traits. Then there's hematochesia. It's not hematochesia. I don't like it when people say no, that. No. It's, it's hematochesia. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Hematochesia, mm -hmm. which is basically red blood coming out the bottom of the tract. And it could that could be coming from several places. It could be very, very low, the anus, the rectum, you know, the sigmoid. And, you know, theoretically, the brighter it is, the more distal it is. Theoretically. <laughs> theoretically, yeah. Um, people don't always read the books. No, not at you all. You know, so you can't count on the fact, oh, it looks maroonish, so it's mm -hmm. probably transverse and right colon, but, no. you know. Um, and sometimes if it's so rapid that it's passing through that quickly, blood is very irritating to the GI tract. It, it gets out like of it. Quite, it, pretty quick. Um, but it's uncommon that if it's really red blood that it's coming from the upper GI tract because usually it gets processed with acid and then it becomes melana, which is black tarry stool. And that's usually an upper GI bleed that's kind of made its way through and had contact with some chemicals and things like that. Um, and, you know, the GI, remember that as you GI bleed, as your GI tract is breaking down the blood, you can get a bump in your urea nitrate your BUN and your labs, so you can look for that. And there are things that can fool you. So if someone's been taking Pepto-Bismol, mm -hmm. Bismuth, or they've been taking iron, that can make their stool look black. So there's some fake outs here along the way that we'll talk right. about. If somebody goes like major crazy and they eat a bajillion beets, they can make it, it looks weird down there. So. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So this goes through, again, the interpretation of the different manifestations, the hematemesis, coffee ground emesis. That is very specific for upper GI bleeding versus, again, they point out swallowed blood from posterior epistaxis doesn't come up as coffee grounds because coffee grounds means that it's been kind of hanging around a little while. It's been a little bit less mm -hmm. active and it's been <laughs> congealing and digesting and now you've got coffee grounds. So all of these descriptions on the left tells you a little more of like how suggestive or how likely it might be a lower GI bleed or an upper GI bleed. And if it's yeah. clots, that's probably lower GI bleed, that kind of thing. You can, you can make some conclusions based on what you're seeing. Now, if you are talking about upper GI bleeding, the most common etiology of that, despite where I work, I would answer the question as varices. <laughs> that is very <laughs> skewed very view of things. Yes. Population. It's actually really, when you take all comers, <laughs> it's ulcer disease, peptic yeah. ulcer disease, and usually it's duodenal ulcers. It can be esophagitis, which we see very often yeah. in pregnancy or erosive esophagitis. That is something we don't always think about. We think about ulcers, we think about varices, we don't always think about the esophagitis, and that is actually the second most common cause of upper GI bleeding. Bleeding. And then you've got duodenitis. Don't forget about Mallory Weiss tears. You can tease that out by history as to when did the bleeding actually start. We've got the varices. And it's interesting that people who actually had a cause of bleeding in the past, only a little over half the time is it actually coming from that same place. It may be somewhere Which else. Which I actually think is really important. Yeah. You don't want to anchor yourself on, oh, they've always, they have an ulcer, it's an ulcer. They have had varices, it's varices again. You have to, you do, keeping keeping your mind open is helpful because they, they can have more than one, which is what a drag, but they can have more yes. than one reason to bleed from your their upper GI side. Yeah. Now, peptic ulcers, it turns out that, you know, it's kind of decreasing overall, but in the older folks, it's actually increasing. And that's liberal use of NSAIDs yeah. and steroids and, you know, drugs kind of leading to more peptic ulcers. And it, again, we mentioned that duodenal is more common than gastric. And H. pylori, once we figured out that H. pylori yeah, was H. pylori, so cool. very responsible yeah. in a lot of cases. But we know that people who smoke and drink alcohol and have renal failure and are these drugs, these are people who are more predisposed. And yes, we give them antibiotics if we detect H. pylori. We give them H. H2 blockers or proton pump inhibitors, or maybe things like sucralfate, you've got the surface protectants, those can be helpful as well. And they can not only bleed, they can perforate, right? And they yeah. can also scar down and cause gastric outlet obstruction, which is very bothersome. Yeah, so, a yeah. lot of vomiting goes with that. 
So, it, so we, we're used to this kind of thing, and we're also used to the kinds of drugs that we use for GI bleeding. So a couple things about them. So PPIs and H2 blockers, which we often will start in the emergency department with somebody with an upper GI bleed, especially if it's a non-variceal upper GI bleed. But I will tell you, and what most of us know this, it really doesn't change outcomes. Um, and honestly, I think the way, reason that most of us do this is to check a box, not necessarily for us, but for some of our GI colleagues, because it is actually something that is a performance measure for them to have these drugs on board. So this, it doesn't harm people. It doesn't necessarily help them a lot, but it's something that um, on their going out the door is something they're supposed to be on. So starting them in the ER isn't a terrible thing. Um, octreotide, we know we use for variceal bleeding. Um, it decreases splanchnic blood flow. We have our dosing sort of regimen we use for this. It doesn't really change mortality, but it does decrease re-bleeding re a little bit. And I think that's any reason, any time you can stop yeah. somebody from re-bleeding and not use blood products, et cetera, that's a good thing. We knew vasopressin is also something used in variceal bleeding. Um, limiting, it's kind of a last ditch effort thing yeah. more than octreotide. Yeah, it's not yeah. an upfront thing. No, it's one of those like, oh gosh, everything is going to hell in a handbasket. It's one of the things you grab. And then the other thing to know, and this is very testable and in real life very important, is a cirrhotic, especially an acidic cirrhotic. So a cirrhotic who has ascites with a GI bleed, giving them a dose of ceftriaxone is what most of the time is used, but an antibiotic decreases the risk of bacterial infections that goes along with this, and it decreases mortality. And like for real, honest to goodness, decreases mortality. So giving an, a, an antibiotic in a GI bleeding ascites patient it should be some of the, something that's sort of a knee-jerk thing for you to do as far as helping people. Lavaging somebody who has a GI bleed. So this is, a, I, I've been around long enough. Yeah, this I remember we used to do this. This thing yeah. all the time. Everybody who said they vomited blood, in fact, it was a big joke because like you wanted to see, have a thing out of triage that said, if you say you vomited blood, this tube is going to go in your nose uh, because we did it all the time. But we know now that that, that actually even just, it's for diagnostically, it's not a great diagnostic choice, you know, test anyway. Putting it down there, you can have upper GI bleeding you don't pick up with an NG tube. Um, it misses up to 15% of those. So, I mean, and, and it's miserable to have an NG tube. Absolutely, 100% miserable. The only time, honestly, I think we use them anymore is if a consultant is coming in to take a look down there and they say, would you please? Um, that is maybe a time to do it, but otherwise I don't think we do it at all. No. Um, the NG tubes just are, they're miserable. They're the, one of the highest rated painful, miserable things that we do to people, which is interesting thinking all the painful, miserable things we do to people, they really hate that. So not, not lavage tubes. But I will tell you, one of the other tubes to be aware of, and this will be in the drawer at ABEM General if you're taking the exam, is a Sangstock and Blakemore tube. Now, I think I've only used them twice in my whole career. Uh, I probably should have used them more considering all the number of variceal pa patients that we see. And this is truly a open your bag of tricks and take everything out. The variceal bleeder is trying to die actively kind of thing. And it's, and it, you, it's in a, it's in, you have it in your ER somewhere. Um, virtually all of us do. It actually isn't as intuitive to use as you would think. Yeah. It is the kind it's of got thing, a lot of little things a about lot it of little tricks about it. I don't like that about it, but no, it's true. It's too hard. Yeah. And, it, and it is worth that. In fact, we have, we have a, like an in-service once a year on yeah. using this just so that everyone at least has seen it once on how to use this thing. And there are videos out there. So if you ever yeah. need to use it, but I will tell you at ABEM general, they're going to want you to consider putting down a Sengstock and Blakemore tube in a life threatening, basically usually variceal, esophageal variceal bleeder. It can work in gas as well, but usually it's esophageal. Yeah. Um, and the key, that you don't use it if the bleeding is stopped. You don't use it if you know they have structures down there or they've had surgery down there. But and it and one of the reasons it's such a big deal is people tend to aspirate. They end up with with trauma to their esophagus. They can end up with tracheal compression because the balloon is so big in the esophagus. It pushes on the trachea. I mean, there's a lot of things that can go really wrong with this. So that's why it's used basically in the most extreme of situations where somebody really is just crashing and burning with varices. Nothing yeah. else is working, and it's something that you can consider doing. And you intubate them first. Yes, every time. always. They're always intubated. Always intubate them yeah. first. The lower GI bleeds, sort of, oh, by the way, um, before we get to lower GI bleeds, upper GI bleeds, you can, we used to admit them all. Like mm -hmm. they all stayed. It was like a just, it, it was one of those like, oh, easy, it's upper GI bleed. I don't even have to think anymore. Well, you do now. We know that certain people are safe to send home. We know that most of them, by, I will tell you, most of them are not. The rebleed rate is pretty significant, depending on what the cause was initially. But there's this thing called the, the Glasgow Blatchford score yeah. that you can actually go ahead and calculate out. And it gives you ideas of like what their age is, what, how were they when they got there, um, what was their history and their comorbidities. And then on top of this, though, the score itself, it doesn't get to stand in and of itself in a vacuum. You also put it in the context of the patient. You know, does the patient have transportation? Is the patient someone who has a fall risk? Or you're going to put it all together, but you can definitely send some people with GI bleeds home. There's no doubt about it. Um, we do it now 
relatively routinely, but just do it safely. So at least get into this and have, you know, look at the sort of risk factors and things yeah. that go with this. I like scores like this. I mean, I you can too. document that you calculated it, you thought about the risk, and right. that can help reduce your risk of liability should something go wrong. But that, you know, you want to put some thought into it and yeah. be, make like it less subjective yeah. and more objective. It's like at the a PESI score or yeah. a HESTIA score where you try to yes. send a PE patient home. Exactly. At least you can say, I really thought about it. I yes. factored all these things in. I had to talk with the patient. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, sometimes people have hematemesis in association with some kind of ingestion, and there are specific drugs to remember that iron is on top of that list, very notorious for causing GI yeah. hemorrhage and bleed and hem hematemesis. Now, you could also obviously have platelet inhibitors. If you um, overdose on them or you have those in conjunction with some in ingestion, you may be more likely to have hematemesis. Anticoagulants, antidepressants are on that list, and when you have drugs combining, you can increase the risk of this happening. So remember that you know drugs can be associated with this as well, and maybe you've ingested a bunch of chemicals that have caused a, yeah. you know, hemorrhagic gastritis and that's causing you to have hematemesis. Like but isopropyl alcohol. Exactly. Is that's exactly big, what I was thinking. Big gigantic of. amounts of that. Yeah. While we talk about hematemesis, we do talk a little, we need to talk about alcohol use because it's linked to a lot of yeah. people who have hematemesis. And, you know, alcohol use disorder includes things like alcoholism and binge drinking, and there's lots of screening tools, and we should yeah. use these. We should look for this in our patients. We have such a high population yeah. of alcohol abusers that come with different types of emergencies that we have to think about alcoholism, and we should know a little bit about it. Well, and it's and it's it's not just your standard, oh, it's the you know person yeah. on the streets kind of person. This, this is the five martini lunch businessman as yeah. well, or you know, the woman at home who's drinking her way through the day. Or There's a yeah. lot of people that can have this that you don't there's no typical person yeah. who is an alcoholic. That's right. So think about screening and really one of the sing if you want to ask one question, here it is. How many times in the past year have you had X or more drinks in a day? And the answer, you, depending on if you're talking to a man or a woman, you vary the number. So it's four for women, five for men. And you know, if they say that it's been more than one time in the last year, they might have a problem. It's not diagnostic, it's just a screening tool. It's a screening mm -hmm. tool to try to be like, okay, I'm a little more concerned about you and maybe I want to refer you for some kind of, you know, for support services if you're interested. Sort and of that thing. is often a a launching point into like the cage question where you get yes. a little more information because if you've had a big old party and you party down well, of course that's your once a year yeah um, but if you get into a few more questions sometimes you really do pick out the ones that's like oh this is this is more than just having so an intermittent party in the th in the in the scope of hematemesis and someone who has an alcohol use disorder they could have anything from just like alcoholic gastritis to I have cirrhosis and I have varices so there's a huge spectrum of what could be causing the hematemesis but it gives you an opportunity assuming they're stable to have a conversation about whether or not this might be associated with alcohol because there's a pretty high linkage there. Right, so varices kind of thing, it's not just the varices, there's a reason they got there yeah. and so something to address.